When I first started out on the job, it was a very different world, especially in regards to body armor for armed professionals. Almost all armor that was being issued out to police and to some security, because it wasn't very common for security to have body armor back in those days, was concealed armor. And it was usually level 1, 2A, or sometimes level 2 concealed armor. You were considered really well protected with level 2 armor in those days. If you were wearing a 3A vest, it was probably something very thick and heavy. And if you were wearing plates, you were getting up into the level 3, level 3 plus level four territory, it was extremely heavy. This was the time that the OT6 standards first came out, which meant back face deformation was just becoming a thing that we worried about. Before that, the old standards had vests that were so thin and so light and so flexible that you could literally ball them up like a jacket and throw them into your bag. There were ads for body armor that had armor balled up like this and then thrown into a bag. Not that anybody thought that was good for the armor, but it was something that you could do. Armor was that flexible. When the new OT6 standards came out, everybody had to come into compliance. And that was, generally speaking, a good thing for the end user, at least if they were safety focused. The new armor was a little thicker and it was a little less flexible, but it was a lot safer for the people that might be getting shot at. Gone were the days of being able to ball armor up, and in were the days of armor making sure that you didn't have any internal injuries. Although there hasn't been any cases that I can find of someone being killed by back face deformation, there were instances of people being pretty seriously injured by back face deformation back before we had back face deformation standards. Now the standards are changing once again. And this is going to be overall a pretty good thing for end users, especially those that are starting out new into the industry today. And the reason is the standards are a little easier to figure out when you're brand new at it, although it might be confusing for some people who are used to the old level one, two A, two, three A, level three, three plus, level four standards. Today we're gonna to compare and contrast some of the old standards with the new NIJ standards, specifically standard 0101.07. And for this chart, we're gonna look specifically at NIJ standard 0123.00. That is the new standards for ballistic protection. Now, before we start talking about the ballistic protection and how they compare and contrast the old standards as far as uh, what guns and what rounds they will stop, we have to talk a little bit about the things that have changed in the testing criteria for the armor because most of the changes that will affect end users, especially those that have bullets whizzing into them, are in those testing criteria and how much harder they are today than they were, say, five years ago. To start out, one of the big initial changes that struck me was that there's now standards for male and female armor. They call it planar and non-planar armor. Female armor testing and construction used to be a little sketchy, I think would be the nice way to put it. There weren't a lot of standards in exactly how it was going to be tested, and there weren't a lot of really great guarantees that that armor was going to work, especially in the areas that were like pleated and overlapped together. The new standards take that into consideration, and also take into consideration slant and not just from angles from the side. So being fired at from this side or that side not only is taken into consideration, but also what happens if you're laying further back as if you're seated in a car and a round hits the chest area directly above the nape of the neck and the possibility for skipping up off of soft armor. A lot of people think that's not possible, but I assure you it entirely is. This new standard is because of real world street experience and because of that, the newest NRJ standards require that all soft body armor be tested for rounds hit in the high upper chest when it's sloped back at a 45 degree angle. This is also very important for female armor because of the non-planar appearance of it, it tends to create those types of angles that could cause a round to skip up into the neck or head a lot more easily. One of the biggest changes is the conditioning of body armor, especially soft body armor, has changed significantly. Where we used to just have a tumbling and a spray on the soft armor of water, we're now going to a long tumble process 
and submerging the armor into water, assuring that any water that could get into the armor isn't going to cause issues for the end user, allowing a bullet to slip through. The back face deformation standards are still there. It's 44 millimeters of back face deformation, more or less. You have to get really deep into the standards. Now, I read all of this so that you wouldn't have to, and not every hit has to be within the 44 millimeters of back face deformation, but there's a long formula that I'm not good enough at math to understand, which allows you to calculate if you have a hit that was over 44 millimeters of back face deformation, whether a larger or smaller percentage of the total number of rounds would be under the 44 millimeters of back face deformation in order for you to still qualify and certify and all of that. So that's going on. For the end user, what you need to know is there is a back face deformation standard and it is going to reduce the likelihood of injuries to yourself if you're hit with a round that is within the standards for it to stop. That's what's important. Uh, also, all of these numbers are plus or minus 30 feet per second when we talk about the different threat levels. Those are really the high points in soft armor. With hard armor, there's additional conditioning stuff that you could look into the standards if you're really interested in. But the interesting thing about the hard armor is there's now specifying exactly where on plates they need to be hit, especially multi-curve plates. There's one hit that is specifically on the crown of the plate to make sure that the area straight dead center at the highest point of the plate, if it's sitting on a stable surface, uh, the, the outer bow end of the plate would be struck that it will actually meet all the performance standards. And there's also standards written in there for angled hits on rifle plates, which might lead some rifle plates that are currently on the market to be a, no longer certified under this standard if they were certified under the under other standard. These are not a quantum leap forward in testing, but they are great improvements for many of the people that are going to be using this out on the road in the purposes they're going to be using it for. Sitting in cars, female armor, we now have more female officers than ever before, and uh, rifle plates. I mean, we never know where rifle rounds are going to come from and from what angle and where it's going to hit the plate. When it comes to threat profile, the biggest change and the thing that's going to be unusual for people uh, right off the bat is that these old threat profiles, your level 1 and level 2A, those are going to be no more. Those aren't even going to exist anymore. There is no new standard for those. Your old level 1, your 22 long rifle and 38 special round nose lead ball round things, that that type of stuff has no place out on the road anymore, uh, anywhere that I'm aware of. This is not something that's particularly useful. And today, if you're finding a level one soft armor vest, you're probably in the basement of a police station, probably a pretty dingy dark area of a police station, or you're in the bargain bin of an army surplus store. Level 2A is still manufactured today. There's still companies making level 2A. Why, I don't know, but your old level 2A standard was a 9mm round nose 124 grain bullet at 1225 feet per second. Uh, and also 40 Smith & Wesson 180 grain 1065 feet per second. Uh, these are both uh, ball rounds. So the idea was if it would stop a ball round out of your duty pistol that would protect people when they're out on the range around other cops or if they accidentally get, get hit with a training round. And also when you're out on the road, uh, hollow point rounds are easier to stop, generally speaking, for soft armor than ball rounds, uh, round nose rounds are. So your 2A was going to stop anything that came out of your duty pistol. And originally the idea of soft armor, and, and something that we still talk about today, is whatever you're carrying, your armor needs to at least stop that. And that was your lowest entry point for soft armor was your level 2A. But that's not going to exist anymore. The lowest entry point under the new standards is HG1. We can just assume that stands for handgun one. It's roughly equivalent to level two. So it's the same essentially standards, nine millimeter FMJ round nose, 124 grain at 1305 feet per second for both of them. And also 357 mag, 158 grain jacketed soft point at 1340 feet per second for both of them. Very similar thing on the HG2 and level 3A. Level 3A is the old standard, HG2 is the new standard. And these are all specified up in NIJ standard 0123.00. Level 3A is 357 SIG, 125 grain flat nose 
1470 feet per second. If you ever use 357 SIG ammo, you know normally the, the nose of the round is flat because there's an overall length issue with 357 SIG. And 44 mag, 240 grain, ejected at hollow point at 1340 feet per second. That's the old level 3A standard. That was your, your heaviest soft armor vest that was being produced. The new ones, HG2 is 9mm, 124 grain, uh, round nose ball. Uh, this is a, a different design of bullet shape. It's uh, the old 357 SIG kind of look like this, and the new one is more like that. You can see how the round nose might work into fibers a little easier. Uh, not a huge difference because your velocities are remaining the same, but still nonetheless more applicable to real-world applications on the street. Uh, where we were worried about high-velocity handgun rounds with 357 SIG, here we're talking about an HG2 dealing with 9mm carbines, uh, shortened barrels, you know, 10-inch barrel or 16-inch barrel pistols or carbines uh, chambered in 9mm. And your 44 grand your 44 mag, 240 grain jacket, hollow point, again, at 1430 feet per second. So the big difference between the old level 3A vests and the new uh, HG2, like this one that I'm wearing here, is the testing standards and the difference in 357 SIG at 1470 feet per second versus 9mm ball at 1470 feet per second. The HG2 is going to be a little more protective against things that you're more likely to meet on the street, i.e., 16 inch or 10 inch 9 millimeter carbines and also because of the conditioning standards the waterproofness standards and the angled hit standards you're going to get a little more protection it's a little more reliable out on the road from the newer hg2 stuff than the older level 3a stuff when we get into rifle protection it gets a little more interesting all of this we could kind of figure all right no more crap armor that's the cheapest thing that the administrator could buy uh, we're going to simplify the nomenclature a little bit for soft armor uh, HG1, HG2 instead of 3 and 3A, which kind of confuses people to start with anyway. And we're going to make the threats a little more applicable to what we have on the street. With rifle protection, we realized that uh, 19 years ago when we were first learning about rifles and having rifles out on the street, I mean, remember when I started 18 years ago, I was the only person carrying a rifle on my shift. The only one, and now almost everyone has one, and we're running into more and more rifle rounds out uh, laying on the street. You're getting shell casings from 762 by 39 556 those types of things at crime scenes. The old level 3, which was considered kind of the standard for rifle protection, was 762 by 51 M80 ball. That's 147 grain uh, steel jacketed bullet at 2780 feet per second. That's your old level 3. And then 3 plus was that plus some other special threat. So you'd have level three plus plates that stopped, you know, M193, M855, 762 by 39, things like that. But it was like an additional plus standard and you couldn't tell just by looking at the plate what that plus necessarily meant unless you went and looked it up. The new standards start with RF1, rifle protection one, rifle one. And those start with that same 762 by 51 M80 ball uh, at 2780 feet per second, and then also adds in 762 by 39 ball. So your AK47, AKM, those types of things. Back to that in a second. Interesting story about those from reading this, the whole standards. And 556 M193 at 3250 feet per second. This one right here means the whole uh, M193 out of a 20 inch barrel. That's that essentially. Uh, that's that's all inclusive of your RF1. RF2 is all of that plus M855 at 3115 feet per second. So again, your M855 out of a 20 inch barrel, essentially. The interesting thing with the 762 by 39 ball with the new standards is that the NIJ specified uh, type 56 from factory 31. There is a notation in the standard uh, that they are going to make an appendix specifying exactly what the specifications of that bullet are. But in the meantime, they're just going to use that ammo that they can buy off the shelf. It's an interesting little, a little tidbit. They say this is going to be rolled out in 2025. I'm going to hold my breath because it came out last year. And literally, there's, there's one company. There's like Safe Life Defense is compliant with an HG2 product. And everybody else is like, eh, we're just keep making this stuff, right? Like, I'm sure there's some stuff in the background going on, but... 
or you might one might need to be flushed out before it gets really far. Uh, RF three gets you to thirty out six AP, which is the same as your old level four standard. So what's interesting here is that uh, the NIJ set it at seven six two by thirty nine ball type fifty six from factory thirty one, a very specific type of ammo made in a very specific factory. Uh, there's an appendix that says that they are going to, or sorry, there's a notation that says that there's going to be an appendix in the future specifying exactly what the composition of that round is going to be. With seven six two by thirty nine, there's so many differences in the construction of the bullets that it, they just had to pick one and go with it. And then RF one and RF two are inclusive of each other, kind of the same way level three and level three plus were, but this specifies exactly what it's going to be on the package. So if you find or you get issued or you buy a plate that's RF2, you're going to know that it'll stop all the common threats that are out on the road uh, under MA55 at 3115 feet per second. So you're on 193, 762 by 39, M80 ball, all of that will be protected by RF2. And then if you get up into your RF3, that's 30 out 6 AP. But it's interesting to note that's not inclusive of all the other stuff still. They never changed that on the standard, which leads me out to a bunch of things that never got changed out on the standard that I find funny or interesting. Uh, we are getting more and more rounds like 5.7 out on the road and people say, well, it's just spicy 22. No, it's not. Those built bullets are built entirely differently and they penetrate soft armor much, much differently. We've shown that on your channel here before. Those types of rounds I would love to see tested against. Uh, even if they're not our primary threat, we're having them show up on homicides now, which makes me think that maybe it's something we should be testing against with soft armor. Also, uh, subsonic rifle rounds, things like 300 blackout. At what level do I need my body armor to be if someone is using a subsonic 300 blackout, let's say for a SWAT application, or if we know someone has a 300 blackout rifle, or just, you know, out of curiosity, what of these will stop 300 blackout? I'm guessing probably HG2, but I don't know. We'd have to shoot it to find out on our own, and I would think that would be something that would be integrated in the standards given how popular that is. In the rifle protection standards, I get that these are really popular, but I'd love to see RF3 be uh, inclusive of things like uh, 6.5 Creedmoor or uh, th maybe 300 Win Mag, uh, 338 Lapua, something like that. Things that are starting to become more popular in a military application and might find their way onto the street via hunting rifles. That is our new standards. If you want to look them up, there are links down below for NIJ standard 0101.07. That is all the testing protocols and such. And 0123.00 is the threat profile parameters. In case you're interested, they split it into two so they could do twice as much work and get half as much done. That's how the government rolls. I should know. If you have any comments or questions about this or you find something in here that I got wrong, understand this is very, very new. I am reading through technical manual at 3 a.m. and trying to hash out exactly what it is. Please put a comment down below to try to correct whatever it is and we'll look further into it. Maybe we'll have to make follow-up videos in the future and I'm sure this is all going to change at some point, especially this one about the threat profiles. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have made it a separate thing if they didn't want to be able to keep the testing changed, keep the testing one way and change the threat profile or vice versa. So I'm sure there's going to be further updates down the road. Hopefully it doesn't take 18 years for the next time for it to update. 19 years, something like that. Until next week, you guys be safe, take care of each other, and wear your vest. That's been your free field training for today. While you're here, uh, check out one of the other videos that we made or down here, subscribe so you can see more or you could check out patreon where you can see how you can get your name put on the videos like all these fine folks over here i'll see you guys next time